My name is Miriam Lamperall. I'm 79 years of age, and I lost my only child, Debbie, in the fire at Grenfell Tower. I've asked Mike Volpe to read this because it's impossibly hard for me to stand up and read this out. But I am here, and I will be coming to the inquiry, as difficult as it will be, to find out what happened to Debbie. I had Debbie in the maternity hospital in Walthamstow in 1971 and brought her home to the flat in Hyams Park, where I still live. Debbie and her father, my husband Reg, lived there together right through her childhood and she stayed with us all through her early adulthood when she took her first jobs until Debbie moved out when she was 31. We were an incredibly close and happy family. We loved Debbie and Debbie was devoted to us. We, we were blessed with Debbie in a way that is very special. Because Debbie was an only child, we encouraged her to have her friends around to play as much as possible. She wasn't a pushy person, even then, but she was always extremely popular and she always loved other people's company and was always surrounded by other people. So the flat was teeming with other children. They loved to play on our balcony, which overlooked the fields and the park that are opposite our house. Debbie always mixed with people from all sorts of backgrounds. There were kids from the local estate, and there were kids who lived in private houses. We lived in a flat, but they all loved coming to play because Debbie brought them together. Where we lived was almost like the country. Right opposite our flat was a huge field and a park, which was a perfect place for Debbie and her friends to play. There was a big field at the back of the school, so the kids had a whale of a time growing up. When it was winter and it snowed, they used to get plastic bags and slide down the slopes in these big, big black bin bags. It was a lovely way to grow up, all of them together. She just loved being with other people. And I remember every night when it was time to come in, she'd say, it's always me first, just because I live on the doorstep. It's not fair that it's always me that has to come in first. Even at the funeral, several of Debbie's friends came up and told me, I remember Debbie would always complain you'd make her go in first. Even as an adult, she'd complain that it was always me. She didn't want to go in because she loved people. She loved being with people and having fun. When I think of Debbie, I think of her laughing. She was always laughing. In many ways, she had a blissful childhood, not because it was so privileged, but because we were all happy. Reg and I encouraged her to do lots of things. We wanted her to try lots of different things, a bit of everything, so she could choose what she liked. She did ballet and tap lessons. We took her to the theater and to see the ballet. She learned the guitar. We went to museums together. I've always brought her up to believe, so she was christened and confirmed and went to Sunday school. She adored sport. She played tennis. She loved watching darts, snooker, and even drag racing, which she'd go and see a lot when she was older. In her younger days, she used to play snooker, but as she got older, I'd say she was more of an armchair sports fan. Hmm. She was always a big supporter of Spurs. She loved watching Spurs, especially with her dad. Debbie really worshipped her dad. People used to say, whenever you look for Reg, Debbie was there. She was his treasure. There's no rush, Mike. Take your time. And she felt the same about him. <clears throat> they would go off blackberrying together, but by the time they came back, there'd be a big tribe of kids with them both. That's what her childhood was like, fun and good. We both worked hard. Reg was a painter and a decorator. And I worked as a dinner lady in the local school for disabled children until I was 73. But we gave Debbie everything we could, and Debbie was always appreciative. 
and wanted to make the most of all of these experiences. We used to go to museums in Kensington and Chelsea and up to Hyde Park, and I think that's where she got the idea that she'd like to live more in that area. It's very different than where she spent her childhood, much more urban, not really my thing. <clears throat> but I think we'd inspired Debbie to find a way of living which suited her, which made her feel happy and fulfilled, because she was happy and fulfilled. When she left school, she started to work in a bank, but really, she wanted to work in hospitality. She loved working with people, looking after them, making sure they had a good time. So she found a job in Holiday Inn in Gloucester Road, which is how she ended up living in West London. She lived at home with us, but the traveling to West London, especially late at night or very early in the morning, got to be too much. It wasn't particularly safe for a young woman traveling on her own, so she moved out to be near her work. I was always worried about her living in the bedsits or the studio flats, as she called it. It really wasn't appropriate for someone in her 30s who worked so hard. The conditions weren't good, and I used to badger her to put her name down with the council to get somewhere proper to live, somewhere safe and decent. Of course, it feels terrible to have done that now, because she was given the flat in Grenfell. She loved her little flat and she kept it lovely, but the refurbishment became a nightmare. She had problems with the electricity, problems with the heating. She was very upset about having the boiler in the corridor right when you open the front door. That was very upsetting to her. But I used to think, well, at least when I go, she's got a roof over her head. My husband died eight years ago, and that was a heavy blow to us both. I realized I had to pull myself together, and I said to Debbie that she should concentrate on herself, getting her own life back together. But she was incredibly kind and supportive. If anything, it brought us closer together. She would text me every morning, and if for whatever reason she had not heard by nine o'clock, she'd be ringing the neighbors, making sure they went round to see if everything was all right. And then she would ring me at night, or if she was working late at the opera, she would text me in the morning and ring to talk in the afternoon, then always text at night to say she was home safely, so I wouldn't worry. Mom, I'm home, everything's okay, love you. She would have me over to stay with her, often for a week at a time, we'd We'd go all around the area, we'd go to Hyde Park together, but recently as my legs got worse, it was difficult to visit. The problems with the lifts made it not very nice to be in there when Debbie was at work, because you couldn't get out easily. She really loved her work. She was really, really happy with her life. You rarely see my Debbie without a smile. People took to Debbie because she was an easy, friendly person. She would help anybody. She loved traveling. Sometimes I'd go with her. Sometimes she'd go with a friend. We'd been to Paris, Germany, Holland, Greece, and Spain. But she went further abroad to places like Sri Lanka. She loved exploring new places, finding out new things, meeting new people. She just really loved life. But she also loved London and her home. She counted herself as blessed. She would visit me every Saturday morning and she would always bring me two scratch cards. And she'd say, I don't know why I bring you these scratch cards, because we don't need money. We're so lucky with what we've got. And that's how she was, happy. She was happy with her friends, with her job, with her life, her neighbors, with living in Labrick Grove. And that's the cruel thing. She did not want more. She felt blessed. My neighbor downstairs used to say she knew when Debbie had come to visit because she could hear the laughing coming from upstairs. People envied me because she was so good to me. And people came up to me even now and say, for that short time, you have more love from Debbie than most people get in a whole lifetime. <clears throat> it wasn't until I lost Debbie that I realized how many friends she had and what she meant to so many people. The kids who used to play with her had mostly moved away to the Silly Isles or Wales or Brighton, but they all came to the funeral. And one of her friends came up to me and said, 
I know you've lost her and she's gone, but she's left so many footprints. And she said, you would not believe how many people loved her. And it's the lives she touched I had no idea about that have moved me most. I've been told how hugely popular and respected Debbie was at Opera Holland Park, where she worked as a safety officer. So many people there, even the singers and orchestra players, as well as all the patrons, knew and loved Debbie, not just because she was responsible for checking things and looking after them, but because she was always interested and concerned with their families and lives. I'm so pleased that an inscribed stone has been laid at the theater in Holland Park in Debbie's memory right at the spot that she would sit and listen to the performances, a permanent tribute to her. I got a message from a lady who lived in the walkways and she wrote to me. She had no idea how to contact me, but she eventually tracked me through her carer and Opera Holland Park. And she wrote to me to say that she and Debbie had become friends and she loved Debbie and she'd said a mass for her. Someone I had no idea about. To me, we were just a normal family, and Debbie was just a normal person. But the morning of the funeral, the whole school where I was a dinner lady stood outside as we passed. The headmaster, his wife, the teachers, because they knew Debbie. They remembered her. And although I had no idea, they loved her too. I am bereft without her. If she had died a normal death, I would have been able to hold her or comfort her and say goodbye. But I feel a part of me has been ripped out. Nothing seems worth it anymore. She touched so many lives with her kindness and her smile. So many people come up to me and mention her smile because she did have a smile all of the time. I don't really know what made her so positive. It's not that she had so much money or anything, but she had her freedom. She did what she wanted to do, and she loved people. And I think that made her rich. The night she died, she texted me. I've got him, mum. All's well. Good night. God bless. I thought, that's OK. She's safe. I went to bed and I got up in the morning and I didn't have a daughter. Her body was burned in the tower, so to say she was cremated is a strange thing. But her ashes were laid to rest on the 20th of April in the city of London. <clears throat> crematorium next door to her father. Sorry. I am an old woman with nothing else left. And maybe it's taken losing Debbie to realize we weren't normal. Debbie was an exceptional, extraordinary person. And I was completely blessed to have her as my daughter. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> Mrs. Rample, thank you very much. That was a most moving tribute. We thank have, you. in fact, got some more to come, sir. I think, firstly, if the lights could go down. <clears throat> this is the step which was created at Holland Park Opera, which is the step we've heard about where Debbie sat when she was working. And so anybody who goes to Holland Park Opera will be reminded mm. of the love that those at that particular venue had for her. There was a memorial service for Debbie, and we are going to see a part of that. And I warn everybody now that it's a very emotional and moving piece of footage. The 
today's important for a very good reason, and not just our sadness about Debbie. Two people here were friends of Debbie's are going to say something very dangerous. I was hoping to. She touched the lives of many of us, and she became our friend along the way. Let's remember the good times that we share. Her smile, her greeting, her empathy, her drive to help others, her kindness and always putting others first. Debbie, we love you. We're filled with sadness and grief at this present moment. We're not ready to say goodbye. So we wish you eternal peace. Debbie, our friend, our sister. I've been asked to say a few words as well, and there is going to be a few because it just hasn't sunk in yet. I've been here for eight seasons, and front of house is my summer family. We may not see each other much or at all outside of the season, but for two months we're a group who have each other's back, especially on combat picnic Fridays. Uh, we catch up, we say hello again to old friends and colleagues. Sadly, Debbie won't be here to do that again, but she's always going to be part of my lovely family. And uh, it's great to see you guys here today. Uh, Deb is always family orientated. I don't think, and I, I said this to Mike the other day, and he agrees, I don't think I ever, ever saw Debbie one single day when she didn't ask me how my mum was. I don't know, 600, 800 times. Even if it was consecutive days, it's, it's about family. There's no use word in our business, but this is our family, you know. A lot of guys come in here today to, to show you uh, that we're a team and, uh, you know, we will carry on remembering her. Mike and I will talk about different things in the future about to remember her more about the moment. You know, you're the centre of our thoughts, what we can do to help you. And we, I can honestly say that we just love having Debbie here. Absolutely love her. And we're going to do some music in a moment that was uh, arranged by Will, who wrote Alison Wonderland for us, and who has written things for the Queen, and when he knew what it was for today, he said he'd come and play himself. It's a thing about, this is a, a different kind of place here, and it's, and it's important to give you that. And so, so thank you for giving it to us. <laughs> We're gonna have, <laughs> we're gonna have a, a moment of silence and then we're gonna sing something. Um, it's an arrangement sir, of Amazing Grace. If anyone wants to join in, his arrangement is probably best if we go along with the melody and rather than anything else. But just uh, let's have a moment of silence and think about our, our, our beautiful.